There we go. So we're going to do a different homework turn-in procedure now on the home page here. I have a link to Google Drive right there. If you've never used Google Drive before, you really, really should. But you need to make a Google account. If you've never made a Google account, you should because access to Drive as well as um, all of the other features that Google makes available is a really good thing. Uh, but this link, when opened up, will take you directly to your classes folder within my uh, one of my accounts here. And I'm going to put homework folders in uh, for every assignment that we have. This was just the test drawing that I put in to make sure that it was visible. Uh, there's nothing in this homework one because we used the uh, Canvas method last time. If you want to throw your homework in here just for safekeeping, go ahead. But homework two, this is where I would like you to put your current homework. So that's going to mean uh, doing your drawings, saving them um, as a PNG, I think is what I request. Let's just check that. See if I put instructions on here as well for that. Yeah, JPEG is fine. PNG is usually what I prefer. TIFF is acceptable, but usually don't. GIF usually don't. PDF if you absolutely must, but JPEG or PNG type, which can be accessed with save as in every drawing program. And then be sure, this is going to be critical now, to name it correctly. So your last name and first name, and then whatever homework it is. And then if you're going to turn in more than one image, just give me an additional number after that so that they all group together. It's going to be critical because you're throwing them into the folder yourself and so I won't know who turned in what unless you name them properly. Okay. Any questions about that? How to use Google Drive? What is Google Drive? Holy crap, what's going on? Am I still audible? I'm audible. Just nobody's going to ask any questions at all. 100% confidence. I don't believe you, but I'll move on anyway. How do you turn it in? You just drop your file directly in your browser window. So once you click this um, link on the home page, it will take you directly to that shared Google Drive folder. If you are not logged into Google, as in you don't have an account, then I don't think it will let you actually copy your files. But as long as you have a Google account, just make make a Google account with any email you want. It doesn't really matter. Um, you have access to Drive right here. okay? Or if you just click on that, it'll take you to the right folder. This is just my entire Google Drive for this account, which I made specifically for school stuff. So that's all that's in there. But you just drag your file from the desktop right onto here. And that will be it. And it will appear there. You want an example? Let's see. Okay. I'll grab, here's a, let's see, turning cards and discs example, dropping it in, giving me a little upload. There it is. Here's a preview. It also makes it very easy to review work because we can just see them as a slideshow as well. Okay. Cool. All right, so that's how we're going to handle turning in homework. Uh, from now on probably because the storage is very very small on canvas it's one gig maximum and then it's done so we're gonna run out of that very very quickly okay let's let's take a look at how to draw basic primitive 3d shapes shall we this may be something that had been covered in uh, previous classes or maybe not um, who has taken a class in which this was actually covered Anybody? Did they teach you how to draw cubes? Uh, to a certain extent, I mainly worked with models and cubes. Okay, emphasis on the word draw. Did they teach you how to draw cubes? As in, like. It's very standard basic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did they teach you how to draw them with any kind of accuracy? shit <laughs> okay so then that doesn't count too much anyway that's what we're gonna learn so we're gonna learn how to draw cubes and actually like really care about what direction all these lines are going 
why it is that we draw them this way, um, how to tumble them around in space. So if I want to rotate these in any direction, then I should be able to. Uh, how to draw cylinders, which is probably the easiest one. So we'll start with that one because it's very, very easy to explain how to do that, although I'm drawing a little fast and sloppy at the moment, but basically good enough. And how to draw spheres, which we did touch on a little bit before, but they are quite tricky because there's a lot of stuff that goes into them that is kind of covered with the other two, such as cylinders, knowing where your major and minor axes are for the sphere, and then how much you want to rotate in certain directions. And then of course, drawing all those ellipses so that you end up rotating in the correct direction eventually. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. Let me go ahead and move this stuff aside. Let's start with a cylinder because that's gonna be an easier one to kind of explain. You probably can draw a circle. You really should be able to draw a circle. Uh, if not, then you're gonna get a lot of practice. Okay, so here's our circle. Assuming that this thing is three-dimensional, we're looking at this circle straight down like on a tabletop, like from above or whatever, right? So the, this circle has no perspective to it at all because it's so flat on this table. But what if we were to like move our face down closer to the tabletop? This thing would flatten out, wouldn't it? I have taken a class. I don't know if I'm allowed to speak though. Of course you're allowed to speak. Yeah, of course you are. Nobody else is. You can you can take full liberty of that. So anyway, if we moved our face closer to the tabletop, like this is a pizza laying on the tabletop or a plate or something, it would get flatter. So the idea is that this line that I'm drawing through this circle, right? is going to remain basically the same even if the perspective of this disk is changing. So we call this the major axis, okay? Major axis. The other one, this vertical line, is the one that's going to shrink as this thing starts to turn in perspective. And that one we're gonna call the minor axis, okay? So just in this position, right, I'm going to draw it as if this was starting to flatten out because my face is getting more in line with what the, the disc is on the tabletop. And so I'm gonna to try to draw an ellipse centered on the same point, centered on the same line, but significantly shorter, like that, okay? So this disc then would be slightly flattened because now we're at like a 45 degree. So if we've got like, here's our table, right? There's our table legs. Here's the pizza laying on the table. The first one, our eyeball was looking straight down like that. Second one, we're looking sort of from a side angle like this. The next one, we're gonna be way over here looking at a very, very sharp angle. And then sharpest of all would be looking straight at the side of this thing, okay? But we'll do one more. So this is number one number two, number three. So this is circle one, circle two, okay? And circle three, if I can manage it. Uh, let's try. Just about manage it. Okay, so that'd be number three. Is very, very flat. And then eventually it just gets completely flattened out. Okay, you guys see what I'm doing? Make sense? Okay, so we're hitting the same points on the major axis every time. When a disc changes perspective, it doesn't need to get any wider or thinner. It just needs to get shorter. Okay, that's all. So if we spread these out a little bit, so we'll start again with a circle. Okay, and if we make some straight lines like this, then I should be able to make this look like a coin flipping through the air if I draw the next one below it a little bit shorter and then a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter as I go down. But I'm putting these guidelines on the side, kind of like a Pringles can, so that I can try to make sure that I'm not changing the width at all, right? So same major axis every time, different minor axis every time, although they should remain centered as well, okay? So let's try to make a slightly shorter version of this one. About like that. Okay, I'm drawing pretty light because I'm used to doing that for my 
first pass, but let's darken it just a little bit. Okay, a little, little messed up over here, but you can always, oh, that eraser was far too big. You can always erase that a little bit. Wow, why is that eraser so huge? Let me shrink that. Oh, I see, I'm using the, the very hard eraser. There we go. Sorry, just messing with my tools a little bit. There we go. So one of your exercises that you can do as you're learning to get a little bit better pen control is trying to change this very gradually and not such big steps. You can see this is a pretty big difference between the first one and the second one. It's harder to make that more subtle, but if you can make that more subtle, you have more control. So let's do another thinner one down here. There we go. And I'm wandering a little bit, but center would be about there. Probably need to bring that out slightly and erase away just a little bit. Okay, let's make it even thinner. The challenge here while you're making them very thin is to keep these round on the corners. Okay, don't have it turn into that. Okay, no sharp corners on a coin, right? No sharp corners on a disc. It should always be round, no matter how um, how thin this gets. Okay, so there's a nice thin one. This one is bad. We don't like that. Okay, let's try a very thin one. It gets very challenging. Ooh, I don't think I can get a very. Okay, so it's starting to flatten out top and bottom because it's getting to be a little bit too hard to draw this by hand, but. Maybe if I zoomed in just a little bit more, tilt my screen just right, give it one more try, let's see. Very, very thin. Yeah, just about. And beyond that, it's gonna start looking pretty sharp no matter what you do. And eventually then it just gets flat, okay? But let's zoom out. So you see how that kind of looks like maybe like a big disc thrown up in the air or a coin flipping through the air that we're getting that 3D perspective kind of effect? Yeah, cool. Okay, I'm just checking the chat here. Maria's typing something. A weird alien eyeball, sure. Okay, it is not more complicated than this for a disc. The only thing that makes this any more complicated is when you want to draw that disc inside of a defined square, like on a, on a box or something. It gets a little bit hazy about how to fit that in there, but basically it's just fitted in so that it touches all four sides. And it tends to not follow these lines so much, right? It just needs to fit on that flat plane. So that is a little bit tougher to explain, but when we get to building a cube, then I can put some spheres on the sides of that cube, okay? I'm not on desktop, so I can't push to talk. Got a text, okay, gotcha. All right, so then let me ask you this. What if we wanted this coin to not just flip this way, right, downward, but we also wanted to rotate it this way at the same time? What do you think we would do? And at this point, it might be helpful if like you had some coins and you could look at them and turn them. Any idea? Turn the middle axis. You actually have to turn both, but yes, you would start rotating this crosshair is what you would do, okay? This major minor axis sort of thing, it never really changes with an ellipse. It's always the same, but you may have to start drastically tilting them in different directions. So if I was trying to rotate this to the side, it would look exactly the same, only now my major axis line might line up like this. My minor axis line might go like this. So I'm still gonna center it, still gonna draw with one wide line and one thin line. It's just gonna be lined up like that. That was a terrible one, let me try again. It's still gonna line up right in the center like that. So however much you want something to turn to the side, you're really just gonna end up tilting 
these uh, these cross lines. Okay, and it'll make more sense. It'll make more sense when I show some cylinders. I think. All right. You guys are so quiet. I can't be sure if you're if you're okay or if you're just panicking inside. Cool. Turn the middle axis. Well, you turn them both. It's a crosshair, so they need to remain at right angles to each other, right? One of them is always perpendicular to the other, so they're never they're not going to do this for an ellipse. Okay, this is what you do for boxes. You have these lines that need to converge somewhere way out here on a vanishing point. Okay, and these ones need to converge way out here on a vanishing point somewhere. And so they end up getting bent. But really for an ellipse that never happens because they're perpendicular to your point of view always. Which is a little bit of a, of a weird trip, but it means that the major axis, this one, the large one, is always pointing side to side from your view and the minor axis is always pointing at you. It's pointing directly at your eyeballs in the scene. I know that that's got to be a little bit confusing, right? Let's do this. Here we're going to make just a basic little perspective setup. Here's our horizon line. Here's our vanishing point. And I'm just going to put rays. So a single point perspective setup. And so we've got all these rays just going in all directions. Okay. So let's put some, oops, there we go. Let's put some uh, disks in this scene. If I want to put a disk over here, okay, however much it's facing towards me or away from me, since my eye is over here at this vanishing point, that's what a vanishing point kind of represents, is that if you look directly in that in that direction, then this is it's really hard to articulate this in words. Trust me, it's where you are. <laughs> but that means that this one is going to have a perpendicular line to that. Okay, so this one um, is the major axis that I just drew, and the one heading towards the eyeball is the minor axis. So if I make it really short, like that, then we've got a disc that's flying away in space over there, and is kind of turned away from us somewhat. Uh, and if I take like another one, like let's say this one here, and I make it a little bit longer so it's closer to being uh, circular, it's still turning away from us, but not as much. So the rays will be the minor axis. Yes, the rays will be the minor axis. That's the one that gets thinner or thicker. And we can do this anywhere, really, like over here. We could do several if we wanted to. So I'll make uh, one right here and one right here, like that. So they're flying away in space in this direction. Uh, you can make them very close to very close to circular if you want, but then there's there's very little perspective. It's as if they're rotated. Whoa, that was wild. It's as if they're rotated. Uh, what you won't get though is you shouldn't ever get um, this line heading towards the eyeball being longer than the perpendicular line. You should never get that. So let's try. I'll try drawing it that way though, just to see. So we'll say. This one heading towards the eye is going to be this long, centered here. And this one is going to be just like that. Okay, so I'll draw that. Does that look like it's in perspective? It looks weird. It's the, the reverse of what we should have, right? It looks warped. Yeah, so maybe this one is actually an oval. It's not really a circle in perspective. It's not following the perspective correctly. So that's the only thing you can't do is that wherever the vanishing point is, that's got to be the line that is shortest. So this one doesn't work. It's like not following the perspective correctly. OK? And I don't know what kind of Twilight Zone madness that is. Just an eyeball with being uh, assailed by little hockey pucks or something like that. Okay. All right, then let's move on to cylinder because a cylinder isn't that different from this disc. We just do it twice. 
We do it twice and we connect them. We can make it a little bit more elegant by remembering that things get smaller as they go away from us, but you don't actually have to do that in order to successfully draw a cylinder. So let's start with the simplest kind of cylinder, which is that both the disks are exactly the same. We'll start again with our two axes. Okay, so we got our major and minor axis, and we're gonna draw an ellipse like this. Whoop, there we go. And so this is either the top or the bottom of a cylinder. It doesn't really matter. Uh, because this one, right, is the perpendicular one, and this one is the perspective one, the length of the cylinder is always going to move along the minor axis. So it's either going to go this way or, or this way also. Okay, so if we just extend this down, let's just extend the walls, and then we copy that exact same ellipse, we'll create the bottom of this cylinder. That could be a little bit tricky to draw the same exact ellipse twice. So be careful about it, but there we go. Now, the thing that's going to make this look a little bit weird is if I draw the exact same ellipse, then it's like x-rayed and it's a little bit hard to tell the perspective. So what I often do is either try to draw the part that would be hidden as a lighter line or as a dashed line, or you could come in here and, and uh, true up that bottom line a little bit by making it darker. But remember, always curving towards the edges, not running into a corner. It should always curve. Okay, So this would be now the top of a can or toilet paper roll or whatever. And that's the bottom of that same thing. Looks about right, doesn't it? Okay. Does it look completely right? What do you guys think? Does it look completely right? Like, yeah, that's perfect, photographic. I mean, it, looks like a sketch. it looks like a sketch, yeah. Is there something like subtly wrong with it, though? The top. What about it? It's, it's a little big up there. It's a little big. You're on the right track, but I think you're thinking backwards. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you're on the right track, though. So if we're looking at the top, right, our eyeball is looking, I don't know why I drew it that way, is looking at the top of this can. Like if there was text written, we could read the top. We're looking through the can, and we're seeing the x-rayed version of the bottom of the can. That means that the top is closer. Okay? And if these are the exact same size, that means it should be bigger. Closer equals bigger. And that means farther should equal smaller. So here's what I want to do. I'm just going to take a selection tool and copy this and paste it right next to itself. Right here. Oh, I can't keep it on a line because I've rotated my canvas, but close enough. And let me merge that back in. So now what I'm going to do, oh, didn't want to do that. I just want to move. There we go. I'm going to shrink the bottom of this just a little bit. Okay, so right now it's the exact same. So down here we're going to leave this point the same, the axis the same, right? And we're just going to take the size, and that means both. So these two axes come in a little bit, these two axes come in a little bit. It's like a target on the inside of that existing ellipse. You don't want to skew it at all. Okay, so we're going to draw it right about that big. And this effect is going to be a little bit too extreme, probably, but it's OK. It'll demonstrate. OK, so there we go, a little target in the middle. And I'm going to erase the line that formerly connected them. Like that. And these little guides in the back. OK, and now I'm just going to connect it like that. OK, does that one feel any better? Yeah, right? Because the nearer thing is bigger, the farther thing is smaller, it should feel a little bit more like it's in perspective. But it looks warped, Maria just said. Doesn't it? It does. It's not perfect yet. 
Okay, so the other thing about this is as you approach this point where the eyeball is, as you get farther away rather, um, the effect of this warping, right, this, this squishing of this pancake is going to lessen. Okay, if you are actually moving away from the position of the eyeball, it should be rounding things out a little bit. Okay, so there's one more thing we can do to get this even better looking. Let me copy it one more time. Okay, and place it next to itself one more time. So what we can do is we can make it when it's farther away, it's a little bit fatter than when it's closer up. Even though they are technically at the same angle, there's a little distortion that can happen uh, because the thing has moved away from our eyeball. So we're gonna leave, however much we shrank this thing, basically we're gonna leave it like that, except we're going to um, lessen the degree of squish on the minor axis, just a little bit. So I'm gonna bring it up here. This one's gonna be a little bit rounder now. Okay. You probably see it as I'm sketching it, it'll start to feel better even before I'm done. Right. get rid of some of those back lines uh, yeah that should be it okay so now let me zoom out does that feel even better yeah. yeah you'd be shrinking the minor the minor axis we did shrink both the major and minor so in uh, this step right so this step is no shrink at all Okay. If you use this no shrink method, you're fine. It's not going to look perfect, but it is accurate. You can use it to build on top of. I would think of this as a more orthographic, if you know what that means, orthographic perspective, as in there is no divergence or convergence. The second step is um, uniform shrink, uniform shrink which is fine. It's not perfect, but it looks much better and it will give you a, a sense of things coming towards you and away from you even better. And then this one is shrink and uh, rounded. So rather than pancaking, it's a little bit more rounded as it gets farther away from us. And that one looks even more accurate than the other two. Okay. So the takeaway for cylinders is this. If you are new to cylinder drawing, just do number one, okay? If you've had some experience drawing in three dimensions, definitely do number two. If you are very comfortable with this concept, do number three because it's even better than the other two. But if you are time pressed and trying to draw something very quickly, just do number one or two. Don't, don't try to make it complicated if you need to do a quick drawing just be shrinking the major um, you know what that's a good point Maria I don't actually know if there's a set of rules that dictates how much to shrink or not to shrink the major and minor axes I kind of do it by feel so it may be that you're only shrinking the major and not the minor axes I'm not entirely sure but that's a good theory um, I could test it out by doing some like camera um, work in, in 3D with actual cylinders and then placing them in my drawing uh, program and measuring to see if it stands up to scrutiny. But I've never actually done that test before, so I don't know. But that's, a, that's an excellent question. It makes me curious about the answer too. Okay. That makes sense to everybody else? Anybody not so familiar with drawing cylinders and this seems a little bit odd? Yeah, it does look similar. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be the same or not, though. Like, so here's here's a test we could do. If I copy this again, let's copy again, and then I make the minor axis even fatter, like fatter than the original one, like all the way out here, and then it looks weird, then your theory holds true so far. Let's see. So if I do this much rounding, oops, I didn't want to zoom that far out. Ah, 
come back. So this is a lot of rounding. And then I'll get rid of this. I don't think I went far enough on the top up here, but now does that look weird? I feel like it still looks fine. But now maybe it's starting to feel fisheye in its perspective. Actually, no, I think it feels completely fine. Ooh, you're really quiet. Yeah, I feel like that didn't that didn't violate any rule. It's still possible, but now maybe the perspective is getting too intense. I think it's the difference between a flatter perspective and a fisheye perspective that the more you do this difference, right? The the bigger the difference, the more of an exaggerated perspective you're going to get. And there is a limit of good taste typically where you don't want the maximal perspective effect because it gets really disorienting. So I wouldn't recommend like going very, very intense with this. One second, I can see Kayla's in the wrong one. Hi Kayla, you're now in the right one. You gotta click on the on the general chat, not the, the hangout one. You were in the in the other one. So I don't know. I would have to do some some tests with like some 3D primitive primitives to uh, see, but this one still seems really good to me. So yeah, I don't know. Alright, let's do a couple more cylinders for an example. Okay, Assuming that you're trying to do this from life, and oftentimes we will be, we're going to be looking at like an arm or a leg or something like that. Um, the first thing you want to look at is how long and what direction. Okay, So if I see an arm extended, I'm going to see this, and these will be the first things that I draw. Just here's the direction that I saw the thing going in, here is the start and the end point of this cylinder. Right? That means that what I've drawn is the minor axis of those disks and it's also the length. And then perpendicular to those, these will be the major axes of this tube, whatever it is. And then I just have to decide, okay, how much is this pointing at me versus how much is it pointing to the side? And that's how fat to make the disks. So this one is pretty long, so it's probably not pointing directly at me. So these will probably be fairly thin. I'll just mark out and say, it's going to be something like that. I can make them exactly the same, like we talked about, or I can make them different based on which one's coming towards me, which one's going away. So we'll say this one's the near side. This one's the far side. Okay. So this one will be a little bit bigger and a little bit flatter. That one will be a little bit fatter and a little bit smaller. So let's go ahead and draw them. So this one can be like Let's make it a little bit wider, something like that. Okay, then this one, same sort of thing, only now it's going to be a little bit smaller and a little bit rounder, kind of like that. And then you just connect the sides. It can be tough sometimes with a really long one, but there you go. Okay, and then you may want to erase out some of your construction if it's going to get in the way or be confusing or whatever. But there we go. So let me zoom out a little bit. There we go. I think I messed up just a little bit on this side, but tube. Make sense? Yes. Okay. So we can do a, another one. Let's do a similar tube, only it's facing much more towards us. This time I'll give it this angle as if this is swung around, right? And now it's going to face much more towards me. So I'm bringing these two points together, right? They're closer and I'll exaggerate the size difference. So since it's aiming more towards me, and again, here is our minor axis, minor axis, then this one's going to be less compressed. It's going to be more circular and bigger. Do something like this. Okay. That one will be a little bit more circular also, but smaller. Okay. Something like that. And then connect the dots. 
connect the dots, connect the dots. Okay, so should be kind of the same tube, but now with even more exaggerated perspective pointed more towards us. Okay, let's do it one more time. Okay, I'm going to give it yet another angle so it's swung farther over. We'll make it right. I want to draw a little farther away, right here. Okay, and it's going to point even closer to our face. It's going to point almost directly at us. So this time, I'm going to put the points very close together like this. And at this point, we might even need to overlap the circles a little bit because it's so much that we're looking like down the tube. Okay, zoom in a bit. So now it's going to be very nearly circular, although probably not quite. Okay, and that one is going to be very nearly circular. And if it were possible, I could exaggerate the perspective even more by making this even smaller. But I'm starting to run into limitations of size of pixels. Connect the dots. Kind of like that. Zoom out. Yeah, basically. Does that make sense to you guys? I think probably I need to go a little bit, a little bit higher there. Okay. Do you guys feel confident using this effect to do your homework? So, is, is there any misgiving? Like, when would you not? Well, if you're trying to do something quick, just don't do all the size difference and, and um, profile difference. So for a cylinder that's facing towards me, fat cylinder, smaller cylinder, line, move on. For something that's going to the side, right? Here's the length. Here's how big I see it being. Boom, boom. It's practically a rectangle, but I could add ellipses in here if I wanted to. It's going slightly uh, away from me, let's say. So I'll make a ellipse like that and one like that, boom, boom, move on. Well, this is easy, right? But I'm using the rules to quickly make decisions. In order to do correct figure drawing, we should do all of the construction first. And then as we're more and more comfortable with it, we can start to kind of, you know, just bash it all together like this. But I know that if there's something wrong with my drawing at this stage, I can put the center point back in there. I can find the direction that I measured. I can find the major and minor axes, and I can correct my ellipses accordingly in order to fix the, the drawing mistakes that I might have, or to true up the correct lines and ignore the ones that are not helping me to describe what I want. So now I'm taking this quick sketch and kind of doctoring it up and making it work better in accordance with those rules. Yeah, something like that. Cool? Cool. So initially, and the way that uh, I've kind of structured the class is that we want to start by drawing slow and careful, using the rules, making sure we understand them, and then little by little, loosen up and just draw kind of what we see and use our observations. So be sure that initially you're doing this the really slow, careful way so that you're sure to understand it. And then later on, we just kind of start speeding through those steps. All right. Cool. Uh, let's go ahead and do a cube then. All right. So for a cube, let's start the same way that we did with the coin. And we'll start with a block instead of card. OK, so this cube is actually just a flat napkin or piece of paper or something that we're looking directly down at. What should we do as we start to approach the same plane that this thing is laying on? So remember, it's like a table with its legs here. And it's laying on top of the table. And right now, we're looking straight down at it this way. So what should happen if we look at it from this angle instead? Which side should be bigger? 
the near side, right? So here's the near side. There's the far side. Okay? So that means that this side is going to exp or sorry, the far side is going to shrink. The near side is going to get bigger. And both of them are going to come closer and closer together. Okay? So the closer this thing is to this flat plane, the closer it is to just being a line, right? So the end is just going to be a flat line. We're not going to be able to tell any perspective at all. But halfway between that, so this near side, right, will raise up a little bit and it'll get a little bit larger than it was before. The far side will come down a little bit and it'll get a little thinner than it was before. Connect the lines. We did it. There we go. How much should that happen? Well, how much are we changing our angle? If we change it even more, right, down here, we should have an even longer near side and an even shorter far side. Connect the dots. Okay. Does that kind of look like this thing is rotating right in front of your eyes now? Cool. So those two far dots, right, these two, kind of go in together and down towards that center line. The near dots will go out and towards that center line. Okay. So if we do this on a big strip now, just like we did before, drawing these guidelines, but they're not going to mean too much. Uh, so we'll start with this one, try to get it roughly square. There we go. So then the next step would be same square, except I'm going to shrink it a little bit. So we'll say, here's the top, here's the bottom. So slightly less tall than it was before. And then we'll make the, the top side come towards us this time. Why not? Um, that means this is going to get a little bit wider. And this one's going to get a little bit thinner. Connect the dots, and it's all straight lines. So there we go. And then we do that again. So this next one should be a little thinner than that one was. And this will get even wider. And this one will get even thinner. There we, go. we can do it again. All right. Even wider, even thinner. And then eventually it gets to the point where it's almost a flat line like this. And then it is a flat line. Okay. Make sense? And again, the difference between how big it started and how big it expands out to or how big it shrinks down to is going to be how extreme your perspective is. The more that size difference is apparent, the more fish-eyed lens you're making your perspective, the more subtle you're doing that, the more subtle your perspective is going to be. So theoretically, if we had a completely flat perspective like this for a cylinder with this card, instead of making the front and back big or small at all, we would start with a card and then we would just make it shorter, which looks terrible, by the way. So we just do this. And it's not going to really sell that effect at all. No. Yeah, see, not really. I mean, maybe. Maybe you could you can see this, this flipping also, but I don't really think so. Yeah, it just looks like it's shrinking, right? OK, so not so good. <laughs> OK, this one's much better. Okay. Good so far? Yes. It is the same intention for getting the effect, 
but you've probably noticing that I'm not using horizon lines and vanishing points, right? Yeah. Well, using horizon lines and vanishing points is a very formal system, and it works so long as everything is on the grid. The thing about a human body is nothing is on a grid, so it becomes useless really quickly, right? So perspective grids are great for cities, they're great for roads, they're great for telephone lines and ladders, because all of that stuff is very regular. Right? You've got this thing that is perpendicular forever with all these divisions that are evenly spaced. So yeah, putting that in perspective works great. But if you've got an arm where one part of it is bent this much and the other part is bent this much and then it's also rotating towards you and then in the meantime the torso is going off in this direction over here and then the head is facing like away from you and it's bent up. It's like where where's the horizon line you're supposed to use for that? There isn't one. Right? There would be a different one for every single piece and it would become just so punishing that you couldn't, you couldn't draw fast enough. So this is like perspective, but it's like the only, the only the most essential parts that you absolutely need to get a three-dimensional effect. So it's like fake perspective or perspective light or perspective without all of the, the careful underpinning to it. Does that make sense? But your question is timely because with this example here, I have one point perspective, right? But with a cube, we're going to have to do this. And now suddenly we do have at least two points of perspective vanishing away from us. And then as soon as we add the third dimension, now we've got three points of perspective. And we just don't have any say about that. We've got to have them because if we don't, it doesn't look like a box, right? So here's the shortcut that I'm going to show you guys. Um, take this box that I just sketched out, for instance. It looks decently enough like a box, right? Hopefully. Uh, I'm going to draw the same box next to itself, but I'm not going to converge the lines. And this fights my instincts, so I may do a bad job, but let's see, I'll give a, a little guideline here and a little guideline um, here or so. So I, what I'm trying to do then is draw perfectly along the center axis, represent the same diamond two times. So let's go like, oh my God. And I want these, these lines should be completely parallel to each other. And it's painful even for me to do this because I hate it. Let's see, did I get perpendicular lines? Okay, close enough to be perpendicular. Then down here, I'm gonna do the same thing. So I should go exactly this direction and then this direction. I'm like fighting instincts to do this. Okay, and then perfectly vertical lines. Okay. Still looks like a box, hopefully. Yeah? No? Yeah. Yeah? Which one looks more like a box? <laughs> or is that just not, not a relevant question? They both look like a box. Yeah. Well, the thing is, this one on the right, yeah, it looks like a box, but it looks like a perfect orthographic box, the same way this cylinder over here looks like a perfect perfect orthographic cylinder. The difference between the two is in convergence, right? And by that I mean the vertical lines on this one on the right, let me get a second color, there's my blue, are heading towards some point at which they're going to touch somewhere. It's really, 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 really far away wherever that point is. In fact, it's so far away that I doubt that even if I measured it, we would, yeah, it would probably be way, way down here somewhere, okay? And the same thing is kind of true for all the other sides. So let's get everything that's heading back in this direction is heading towards a point eventually where they're gonna touch. Where? I don't know. And same thing about these, they're heading 
somewhere and including this one back here that we can't even see is heading somewhere where they're going to touch. That's what perspective basically is. It's that things that are parallel get closer together and a box should not have slanting sides. You know that. And so these not slanting sides are actually just converging in perspective somewhere. Same thing for the for the left side, same thing for the right side. So that's how we kind of fake the fact that this box has perspective as opposed to this one where they're perfectly parallel forever. They're not going to converge. So something about the perspective is screwy or just missing. Does that make sense? Convergence. Okay. So that's what you can do to make your boxes better. But like I said with the cylinder, if you're new to this, if you're uncomfortable with this, just do parallel lines. It's not wrong. Okay, it's going to lack a certain depth that doesn't really matter. It's still going to be a completely valid uh, drawing of a cube like or rectangular like thing. Okay. Okay, just checking the chat feed here. All right, any questions about that? Just that concept. You guys good? Okay, so. So then here's the thing, same way that this box here got shorter right, in this direction as it turned in perspective, it means that if this was a diamond like this, it would still just get shorter. That's all that would need to happen. So if we've got a starting shape like this, this is some sort of box shape in perspective. Don't worry about the particulars, some sort of box shape. If I'm going to move my eyeball more in line with it, it just needs to get shorter. That's all. You can kind of treat it like a disc, that this is the major axis, this is the minor axis, kind of. Okay. So if I want to draw this again, only we're getting closer to the flat surface that it's on. I just need to draw it flatter. And if I want to keep doing that, it's going to get even flatter. And you'll see some little bits of this are kind of wandering around because this is an approximation, but eventually we get so flat that we can hardly see any perspective and then eventually poof, it's completely flat. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So that's one part, or that's several parts. So here's a single face, right, turning in perspective. Here's the idea of getting cubes to look better than just a, um, a plan view cube, but you can absolutely do number one as opposed to number two if you need to. Okay. Here's how we can treat a diagonally oriented face. The only other part that I can tell you as far as a shortcut of drawing cubes is this orthographic cube right here is the maximum amount of surface you're going to see on a cube. So we've got three different faces. We've got, let's just color code them, a blue face, right? We've got a green face. Well, let's keep Maya color, shall we? Green face and a red face, right? If you're going to see more red face, you're going to see less green and blue face. Okay? If you're going to see more blue, you're going to see less green and red. If you're going to see a lot more blue, you're going to see a lot less red or green or both. Okay? And that may sound like nonsense, but it won't when I start drawing this. Okay? So let's take that for example. Let's move it down here. Which face would you like to see more of? blue, more blue. Okay. That means blue's wall is going to move that way. And maybe that way it's going to be fatter. Those other two are going to be thinner. Okay. So let's make a bigger blue side like this. And then to get rid of a little bit of green and red, it's going to have to be a little bit flatter too. So that green thins out. 
and red needs to thin out a bit as well, kind of like that. Right? See how there's much more blue now? Less red, far less green. Okay? So this one just got bigger. Those ones got smaller. Should we do it again? Should I make even less red or should we get rid of green entirely to where we can't see it anymore? Get rid of green, okay. So at that point, we're gonna, we don't have to rotate this way anymore, right? We're just gonna have like a flat top and a slight convergence on the bottom like this. And that's gonna look a little strange, right? So maybe I give just a tiny sliver like that. Or maybe I make the perspective go the other way so that we really don't have any green at all. And now we're looking right in the center of the box where we're looking down at the bottom of it and up at the top of it. And we just don't have any green at all. Looking at it, I'm thinking like, oh, that's a little too thin. I need to move it out so I have more space over there. Okay. But eventually, right, if we keep going in that direction, not only we're we not going to see green anymore, we're going to start to see the bottom, right? So at some point, we pass a threshold where now, whoop, sorry, now we're going to need to see the bottom of that box instead. And then that stuff's falling away in perspective, and suddenly we've got this new face revealed on the bottom because we've gone too far. That makes sense to you guys? So how this is going to come into play with the figure is you're going to have a person who has a really complicated looking like hip bone, right? And another complicated looking hip bone over here and like a sagittal area in the back and like there's these pubic processes in the front and we're looking at this and trying to decide like, oh, okay, what direction is that thing facing? And so we really just kind of like simplify it into a box. We say we can see these landmarks on the outside of that person. And we build a box and say, this is what their, their hip assembly is doing, right? Something like that. But when you draw it, you might decide, oh, the box that I drew for this pelvis, I'm not seeing enough of this side. I'm seeing too much of the front. So then you need to fix it by extending out this side a bit and saying, actually, this was more like this angle. And what I was seeing in the front, I thought I was seeing so much of the front, I'm seeing far less than I thought like this. Because now we've revealed more of the side by rotating it and hidden parts of the top and parts of the front. Make sense? That's how that's going to come into play. So being comfortable drawing a box and changing its angle little bit by little bit is going to be a valuable skill. All right. One more to go. Any questions yet? Absolutely sure. OK. Robert, sure. That's good enough for me. Sphere. Sphere is the weirdest one because it's got all three dimensions just like a cube, but they're all made of disks. And so it can be a real, real mind uh, job to try to figure out what direction the sphere is going. The easy part is how big it is and where it is on your page. You're done. You did it. Congratulations, you drew a ball, right? The hard part is determining exactly what direction it's facing because you've got stuff that you want to put on it, right? If you want to put some ears on it, a little ear over here and an ear back there somewhere, you need to know where along the back of it, where behind this silhouette that ear is attaching, so how much of it's going to be visible, right? or what axis these ears are tilting on, or where exactly in this big field the nose should be. Uh, here, uh-oh, here? 
sticking off the edge, no? Over here, somewhere, showing a round back perspective? I don't know, right? Uh, get frustrated. Nose unicorn. Nose unicorn, yeah. <laughs> so that's the tough thing. So first, you're gonna start with uh, how big is the, the sphere? It's usually gonna be the head. Um, I think sometimes we'll use like an egg for the rib cage or maybe even for the pelvis, but um, where is it? How big is it? Draw it, okay? Then there's always gonna be a point right in the center where the axes are going to extend from. And then the question is, what direction are those axes pointing? So use whatever axes are the most obvious. You've got three. The third one will take care of itself. Just worry about what is the most important and the second most important. So if you see the head tilting over to the side, like a person doing this with their neck on one side and their shoulders are here, then this one and this one are probably gonna be the most important. And that third one, that depth one, isn't gonna make any sense. So we'll do this first to see, I saw that person tilt over the side. Then the second one, is almost certainly gonna do this, but sometimes it does something else. So you may want to do the ellipses first for this one. You saw it do that. Do you also see them rotating their head in either direction? And the way we're gonna find that out is we're gonna use landmarks for the body, so don't worry, there's gonna be ways to determine this. On the head, usually it's, is the nose on the left side of this mass, or is the nose on the right side of this mass? And that will give you this ellipse. But let's just say it's on the left-hand side, about uh, here or so. Well, now I've got a ellipse that I can draw. Okay. So I'm gonna draw an ellipse, I'm gonna try to pass through that point. I know that this part that I'm seeing is the front. Okay. So I can draw that part and I can kind of ignore the back, but you might wanna just ghost it in there like that. Okay. So now we definitely do have an axis here but we might, might want to figure out, did we see the head tilting up or tilting down at the same time? I'm drawing this nose kind of high, so it seems to suggest that I'm seeing a nose somewhere around here, therefore it's tilting upward. Well, now I've got another ellipse that I can draw through this point, right? And I know that this is the front, so it's the part I'm going to draw darker. There we go. And then if you want to, you can ghost in the back there. And we've kind of done it. To draw a line straight out this surface point from the center would give us an, a three-dimensional arrow that's kind of extending out of the ball. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Do I have three dimensions represented here? As in drawn or visually? Drawn. So where's that third where's that third line supposed to go? Outwards? Over here? The third line would be the top point and the bottom point that connects to this ball. And at that point a lot of people's brains explode. And they go, how am I supposed to figure that out? Well it's just sort of implied that if you tilted up right from this center line that means that this came around from the side from the silhouette and it came around this little wrapping line a little bit and this one went back around that wrapping line a little bit so it's almost implied already from what I've drawn but sometimes that's not good enough and sometimes you need to actually locate it okay I will tell you this, I was never taught to draw all three wrapping lines on a ball to make it three-dimensional. I was taught to draw one for sure, the second one if you need it, like on a head you do need it. After that, stop. You can figure everything else out from just like um, lines that are extending up or down. Okay? So if I did this though, let's do this. So here's the point where those two discs intersect. Here's the point where the back ones intersect. This is my depth line depth this one that I drew initially is my height line that we already had had and then that means that this one that sit, hits the edges of the ball that's my width line okay 
as long as your additional lines are perpendicular to those ones, you're drawing a box again and you're basically fine. Okay? Any more complicated setup than that is too much. Okay? It's going to be too slow. You're going to have too much measurement and it's going to become a real pain to draw a, a ball at that point. Okay? Does that make any sense? I know this one is the hardest. Yeah. Okay. So if we draw a couple more spheres, first, how big it is. Okay. Second, middle point. Do I see it tilting? Do I see it rotating? And usually there's going to be some landmark to tell you that stuff. So if I see a nose somewhere way over here, okay, then that tells me that probably the head has been tilted up a bit probably it's rotated over it may also be leaning I don't know okay assuming that it's not leaning we'll just say it's tilted up like that and that it is also rotated over this line might remain a flat disk if I don't see any towards or away rotation this one might just stay flat it could okay but the other one perpendicular to it definitely is all the way over here almost to the edge so I'm gonna to have to draw my wrapping line pretty big but not quite as fat as the original ball so it's something like this okay all the way down here uh oh slightly bumpy Try that. all the way down there okay this is the silhouette of the ball over here that's the wrapping line of the ball where the, the nose would actually be attached. And if I cared about it, I could extend it back here and find the exact opposite side on the back of the head also. Okay. So in this case, coming out the head in that direction from this point. Okay. If we wanted to extend vertical line from that point for like the jaw purposes, we just follow this axis line that we've already determined. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm asking a lot because I know that this is the the weirdest one. It's the hardest one to kind of wrap your head around. If you were going to have trouble, I would expect it with the ball. We good? Did we do it all? Um, pyramid would just be instead of a box there's a point in the middle that you draw everything to also not really going to be an anatomy primitive the anatomy primitives are these three right we're going to have some kind of rectangle or cube some kind of long or short um, tube a lot of tubes tons of tubes and then also a sphere usually just the head occasionally something else like an ankle pivot or um, let me think what else maybe a shoulder um, occasionally the pelvis or, or maybe um, one side of the hips or the other but really there there aren't many other shapes on the body that we have to concern ourselves with but it's a good point like there might be oddballs like let's just take a football what if we what if we had to like perspective a football okay here's the here's the football and I'll give it a center line and we'll give it like it's two it's two stripies on the side along with it stitching okay there's our football what if we wanted perspective of our football what would you use like which one of these sets of rules might help with this yeah I mean it's basically just a couple cylinders I think so as long as I use these rules on it I should be okay I know that the middle one is the thickest then this one's thinner and then this is just a point so there's gonna be a line running straight through the football and there's gonna be one big wrapping line the other ones are going to be smaller but they should be at the same angle if I'm using rule set number one or converging a little bit or getting bigger a little bit if they're closer or farther away from me so let's try let's see so here I'll say is the center wrapping line of my football. 
that's the major axis. This is the minor axis. Okay, so my other two are going to be somewhere along this line. How far away? Well, it's up, kind of up to taste. I should kind of figure out how big they should be compared to the first one, like this big. Looks about right. Okay, so let's put that right here and just kind of hope it's okay. And we'll put another one up here. And then somewhere a little bit farther on from that is going to be like the point of the football, like here. So cross your fingers, and I'm just going to draw an arc that links all of those. Let's do it on this side too. Okay. So then I take a look at it, and kinda. I mean, does that look like a football moving in perspective to you? Yeah. A bit, yeah. And we could just add some details now. So we could say, okay, here I'm gonna add a second wrapping line so I can have that white stripe over on this side. And I'll do the same thing over here. We'll put one right there, one right there. And then if we wanted to get really fancy, we could say from the top to the bottom, the stitches should be here. So we'll just make another line all the way from the top to the bottom. And it's going to be flatter because this is the center line. That's the silhouette. And then we just put like a bunch of stitches following the wrapping lines like that. Yeah, let's try one more. Let's say it's going farther away from us going this way okay and this will be the middle so here's our major axis and it's going to be going very nearly away from us so we'll make it big and fat like that so that means this will overlap somewhat so will that one it's getting real messy but oh I'm drawing too small that's why Okay, so it's just this one, this one, and this one are going to be the visible ones. A little bit farther on than that, kind of estimating is going to be the point. I'll we'll just say here, and then we try to connect them. Yeah, basically got the idea. So here's the white stripe on the back. Here's the white stripe on the front, which is going to be so thin we probably won't see it. And then the stitches can go, we'll just make them go straight down the middle like that. Yeah. So this sort of thing actually will come up with the body. Um, what I'm doing is just using some basic rules of perspective, utilizing the primitives, right? Modifying them a bit so that they kind of represent something different. But then also we're like following the contour of the football with those stitches, which is going to be critical for some parts of the body. Um, you're going to have ribs on your chest that need to follow the perspective of the bend of the torso. You're going to have muscle groups, which are attached to the surface that need to follow the way that a cylinder is bending and whatever direction something is bending along it. So we might have to make tubes that like wrap around something like this. And at that point, we're going to need to be familiar enough with the direction that that tube is going in order to attach those new pieces. Okay. Cool. Any questions? Any at all? You guys know what your assignment is? Yeah. 10 of 10. Right. I don't know how to spell cylinder. ER? Cylinder? Nailed it. Yes. I am literate. 30 total. Do as many as you want beyond that, but 10 of each minimum so that I can see you comfortable with it. Also, I didn't mention it, I don't think, in the instructions. Don't do 10 of the exact same one. 
if you have 10 of this cylinder, you didn't really try to learn very much about perspective, right? Try to do different cylinders. Do what I did. Move them along, changing the angle a little bit. Um, I have an education in animation, so I love doing the little adjustments like this because they make sense to me. I can see how something transitions. Or you can make them wildly different, like this football has wildly different positions. Okay, But whatever you do, try to make sure that you understand the concept enough to put it at any angle comfortably. Okay. All right, you guys, if that's it, then I'm going to stop recording and that will be the end of the lecture for today.